There we go. Are we all seeing a big full screen taking rails offline yep. thing? Good stuff. All righty. Um, cool. So this is uh, taking rails offline. Um, I kind of want to go through some of the techniques, um, the, the progressive web app techniques, PWA, and um, the techniques you can use to kind of this make your app more reliable when the network's a bit flaky and potentially make your app work offline. And it's really cool. Um, so what are we going to do? Um, I'm going to kind of give you some fun scenarios we can, where this is kind of applicable. I'm going to kind of show you how to do it and then show you some libraries to like do it way faster because, you know, who wants to have to write and maintain lots of code? And then we'll go through some gotchas and some wins. I think it'll be about 15 to 20 minutes. And I have a little demo if like I run through this way too quickly. Um, and hopefully you'll enjoy it. Um, so throw up some emojis if this scenario sounds really familiar. Um, have you ever been on a train and you're like wanting to read the like the the news and you go to the site and it, the, the network is down and you can't read it? So that will sound quite familiar. Like thumbs up, nice. Okay, cool. I'm seeing lots of thumbs up. That's good. Okay, what about you're at home and then someone starts torrenting on your network or downloading a big file, and the website you want to go to the view is just a bit slower now that happened to someone okay cool cool and lastly have you ever like been visiting a website and then it just like goes down while you're using it and you can't look at it anymore okay cool so these are all really really good um like things which like uh the pwa techniques are good for mitigating against where we can kind of like just kind of just make things more reliable and it's it's quite fun the way we're gonna do this um, today is we're gonna use a little bit of browser technology called a service worker. And they were released about 2016 time. They went on iOS for a little while. Um, who's heard of them? Um, they have really good support now. So everyone kind of, yeah? Okay. All right, cool. I'll, I'll go through, through them then. Um, if you've ever visited like a website like twitter.com or like most sites and click the application tag, you'll probably see something like this. It's a little JavaScript file, which Twitter has told your browser about, which kind of this runs in the background and it kind of does some stuff, which is quite cool. For the most part, it's used just for downloading a bunch of files beforehand and saying, okay, when you actually request this file, I'm going to use the one I've downloaded ahead of time, which is quite nice. So on Twitter, they don't just kind of send you everything in one go. They send you the stuff to see the main bit of the site. And then they send like another 20 megabytes or whatever of JavaScript because, you know, that's what front end people do. Um, and you can kind of see this at work. If you've ever like kind of sat there refreshing pages to figure out how fast they are and how they got quick, um, yeah, Twitter, because they have a little service worker, all the JavaScript displays incredibly quickly and so do a few other of their pages. And that's quite cool. And we can do that using a service worker. Um, and if you perhaps go offline or their network becomes inaccessible, they have like a nice fallback as well, which I think is kind of a nice thing to have on a website. And you can totally do this with Rails and a little dash of JavaScript. Um, and if you even want to have a bit more fun as well, um, if you're in Firefox, you can go to like about debugging and have a look at all the service workers which are running. I totally recommend it. It's probably like a list about three lines big or something of all the ones you've collected. And if you smash the inspect button on the page, which is like there, you can have a little peek at their code and see what they're actually doing and how they're using this little JavaScript file. So, I've talked a lot about service workers and I probably haven't explained them that well, but when you traditionally like request like an application, like as a user, you're probably just going to make your request out to the internet and then you'll get the data back. When we add a service worker to that, it sits in the middle of that request and lets us tamper with it. So um, and it's a JavaScript file, but the browser will go, okay, let's go through the service worker. The service worker will say, yep, yeah, um, I've got this file cached, use this cache of over here, don't even touch the network. Or it'll be like, you know, I'll ask the network first and if you fail, we'll fall back. The cool thing you can do there is if the internet suddenly disappears, then you can just always use the cache like kind of pragmatically. Does that all kind of make sense to everyone? Everyone kind of keeping up? Cool, nice. All right, so how do we add this to our Rails apps? Because, you know, it's, it's quite fun to use them. 
So we have to do a little bit of JavaScript. Um, don't worry, I'm not going to have too much JavaScript in this talk. I know we're all rebus here. But this is like the first thing you'll need to do. And the first thing we do is kind of check that the browser does support service workers with this kind of line up the first line here. And then we wait for the page to be kind of loaded and ready. And then we go tell the browser to go download this file, go check it out, go register it. And the browser will go, oh yeah, I will go download that file and I'll go run it. That's cool. And normally they're called like service worker JS. And so you can stick that in your application.js file and that will just start doing stuff. And then if you want to kind of get started really, really quickly, um, I had a lot of fun just dropping a file in like public slash service worker, the public folder, and just dropping like some raw JavaScript in there where I listened for like some key events, which the service worker things are kicking off. So the install one is when it's kind of first seen and for that you normally like just download a bunch of stuff. And the fetch one is where uh, like the browser is actually making a network request. And in this case, I literally just went to that debugger thing we had um, earlier, whacked in like console log and a few other things and just kind of had a mess around to see what happened. And it was quite fun. Um, and there's also this really awesome website called service workers, like .rs, which I thought is such a good fun. Um, and it's a cookbook made by Mozilla where they have like all the little JavaScript snippets you can copy and paste and like kind of mess around with. Um, by the way, um, I'm going to drop all the links to everything I'm mentioning in the chat afterwards. If you want to write anything down, just don't worry about it. Um, and yeah, this, this website is pretty nice. It's like literally big JavaScript files. They've annotated everything. You can copy and paste it and then you can mess around with what you want to do and they've got all the various techniques for like caching or like the strategies even so like if you want to always have stuff on the cache then it will show you how to do that or if you want to try the network and then fall back to the cache it will show you how to do that however we are rails people and is there a gem for that there are two gems which is pretty good i was, I was so happy when i found these two so we've got service worker rails and webpacker pwa um i tried like both of them out and i thought they both were pretty good um, so I'm going to quickly run you through how they both work, what's the benefits of both of them, and we'll have a little bit of a mess around with them. So here's kind of a side-by-side -side comparison. Um, the service worker Rails one will work really well with the asset pipeline. And you literally do like one command and then bam, your JavaScript is there and you don't have to even touch it and you'll just get like a progressive web app Rails app and it's quite cool. Um, it does kind of give you a bit of a vanilla JavaScript file to mess around with, but um, you can kind of tweak it and play around with it. Uh, and then with Webpacker PWA, it's made for the Webpacker gem, which is in like Rails 6. Uh, it's a bit more complicated, but you can use this really cool tool called Google Workbox, um, which is uh, like a library Google has made to make writing service workers a bit easier and stuff. Don't worry, um, I'll give you a quick demo of that as well. Um, so with server worker Rails, to kind of get it going, you just do bundle add service worker Rails that adds it to your gem file and runs bundle. But like, is, is everyone using bundle add now? Have we all seen that? How cool that is to like add gems to your gem file? It's going to change your life. Like you never have to add anything that even open your gem file ever again. It's, it's amazing. Um, I digress. Um, and then once you've added that gem, you'll get the little generator specifically for that service worker, like set of files. And it's going to add a bunch of files to your repository. And you can probably take a best guess about what like most of these will do. So um, you've got like the modification to the application JS is it's just adding some extra stuff in there. Um, the manifest, it's again, it's kind of telling the browser about some stuff. The service worker is it setting stuff up, and the other stuff is it just adding extra bits. And you can mess around with the gem and have a look at them. It's very like you look at it and go, oh, that's like one line, and it's very ah, oh, like I can figure that out. But we're going to go through the ones I've highlighted quickly. Um, so in this JavaScript file, it uses uh, ERB, like js.erb to kind of load up stuff like your application.css and kind of create a nice array of files you want to cache ahead of time and an offline file. Um, the end result is when you just open your app, you get a your uh, service work kind of debugging paddle and it will just say hey i've got all these things downloaded and if you go to request them you're going to get this file as opposed to me making a network request um, and then you also have this little magical bit of javascript where it's like okay i'm going to try the network first and if i can get a response and i'll return that otherwise i'll check my cache and 
it, it's in there. You can kind of have a look in the file, but that's the main main gist. You can see it kind of says if it doesn't have the file, it's going to return the offline file. So yeah, um, if you're suddenly turning off your app, you get this really nice, hey, it looks like you've lost internet connectivity. If um, suddenly your app goes down and that page is not cached, which I really like. There's something quite nice about like saying, hey, you need to be online to use this app. That's, that's nice. But we can do a little bit better though. Um, Webpacker PDA is a bit more customizable up the box. It's a little bit more tricky to set up. Um, I tried to put all the setup instructions on like one or two slides and it was like, it was just a monster. I was just like, this is this is confusing me now. Um, you have to add like this yarn package and the, the gem, but once you've got them, they've got instructions on their main repo where you edit the environment and the Webpacker file. I am also going to um, give you a link to a repo where I've set this all up already um, and the last commits of me just setting this up. And it's it's like uh, it's like 20 lines or something where you can just kind of look at the diff. But the cool thing is you can use this tool called Workbox from Google, which this is how you kind of tell the browser like, hey, um, if someone's making a navigation request, let's cache that and try the network first. And I feel there's something quite readable about this code. I'm not sure if anyone's trying to make sense of this, but yeah, it's like he's register a route. And yeah, I feel that's a bit more, a bit more readable than what we had like on that versus my preference. Um, and they've also got a massive cookbook as well, stuff you can kind of copy and paste and mess around with to like get your exact setup perfect. And the end result is um, I was able to get like a little app up and running where um, the actual assets are always served via the like the cache from the service worker. So the response time was really, really fast. And then when I did actually turn off the web page, it would uh, kind of like fall back to stuff it had pre-downloaded, but it had an extra like thing to it where when you visited a page, it would just remember the last few pages you went to and cache them. Um, I have a very quick demo of this exact app. You can kind of see it kicking in here. Um, so, if I go to application, you can see I've downloaded a few pages. You can kind of see this is like ridiculously fast for what it is. But if I was to then like put myself on a slow 3G connection, it's still really quick. And if you look really closely at what's going on in the network, it's actually making the network request like uh, like it's it's going to make the network request. The network request is too slow, so it's loading the cache which is really cool. So if you're like um, Heroku Dino is falling asleep, it's quite fun for people to, or you're doing a deploy, it's kind of speed stuff up. And then if you also take your app completely offline, everything will still kind of work quite nicely. You can see the um, the actual network request is failing and it's just loading the cache. But then if you go to look at something you've not like seen before, then it will just throw like a, hey, you're offline, which is kind of cool. I really like that. Uh, did I just break that? Okay, maybe that just broke. That's cool. Um, cool. So it is a little bit hit and miss sometimes as well. Um, so I think that's like quite a cool thing we can do. We can make like our apps like just a bit more resilient to not relying on the network as much for stuff. And that gives us a nice performance boost. And yeah, you can kind of see what I just showed you there. Cool. Um, but there are some gotchas. Um, you can kind of tell like I've got like a love hate relationship with, with like service workers. Um, the URL always has to be the same. You can't use like an asset hash or anything in it. Otherwise, you'll just register like hundreds of them. So if you're using like uh, the asset pipeline and trying to just output a file, that just won't work. That's why I, was, I started off putting stuff in slash public. Um, the amount of data you can cache is it varies wildly based on the device you're like kind of trying to target. So if you're targeting like an Android phone, it's a lot less. And if you're targeting a browser, it's more. Um, I figured out it was about 25 megabytes based on a Stack Overflow post is about the safe amount you can cache, which is nice. Um, and um, I got really screwed while I was building this. Um, I had a service worker running and it was making my site look like it was working fine when my server was off and I was frantically refreshing a page and like nothing was changing. And I was like, what is going on? Am I an idiot? And turns out I was an idiot. So that was, I felt great. Um, it's also like, because you're messing with requests. So as you know, you're putting your request for a service worker, you can totally end up giving yourself a bad day. Um, one of my friends, they added a service worker to their website and it was all going like really great. Um, they weren't getting any emails or any messages. They thought everything was fine. 
turns out every form submission was just failing quietly <laughs> and they just hadn't realized um so you have to be like quite careful um and there also isn't like a perfect like ruby gem to configure this i think there's definitely something coming out there someone can definitely make something which is better than writing all that javascript so if anyone wants a fun gem to kind of build where you just kind of play with all these things it'd be quite a good one to put together um i'd definitely appreciate it um and it's also not suitable for all apps i'm i got really lucky i asked one of my friends who works at ikea and he's superly high up and like does all the front end for them and he was very clear that this is just his opinion and not the company's one but he kind of said that if people aren't visiting your site that often, it's kind of not worth the effort of building a service worker and maintaining the PWA stuff. Because like, if they're only going to visit a few times a year, like what's the point? Um, however, there are some like really nice wins. So I've talked a lot about asset caching and kind of like speeding stuff up. I think that's like the really big win you can have. Like imagine if you don't ever have to have a user download or even check the network for like things like fonts, CSS files, and JavaScript. As long as that URL is the same, it's like there on their machine. It doesn't even go out to the network. You don't have to worry about CDNs. Um, you, offering a couple of key pages offline is really cool. Um, it's a really cool trick to do, like to this kind of tell someone to turn off the, the network and or clients turn off their network on their phone and then their website still works. That's definitely a cool way to get some money out of them <laughs> if they're kind of want something fun um the good example i'd kind of use for that is like news article websites um where like maybe you want to have the top things cached and you can do some cool stuff like pushing content to users um the other ones are kind of like you know fetching content ahead of time because you can tell the browser to go download something so if you've got like an endpoint which is slow like um maybe with jason's one where you had that slow request if you can't be maybe if you can't figure out what is making it slow or maybe it's just a slow has a lot to do you could get the user to request it ahead of time um, using a service worker and capture response, which is cool. And also DDoS mitigation is the other really cool thing. Um, has everyone heard of Parler? Like we all heard about that in January um, where they they ended up using progressive web app techniques to temporarily like keep their site in a read-only mode for people, which I thought was like, they're totally evil, but like what a, like as an engineer, that's incredible. That was really clever, I thought. Um, cool. Um, and if you are kind of curious about learning about more about service workers um, specifically in PWAs, really good timing. DHH um, was talking about Hotwire, and then I casually noticed he had this tweet where he was like, um, "If you want to make your apps offline with Hotwire, a service worker is kind of a potential good way of doing that." So I'm, I'm wondering if like maybe something's coming in Hotwire for um, PWAs. Maybe if not, they're still like I'd really love it if someone made a good gem. Um, cool. That is that is everything. That's me. Um, so I'm Mike Rogers. Um, I've got like a Twitter handle. I'll drop some links in a second. Um, did everyone find that quite good? Very handy. Are we all excited to try out PWAs? Good stuff. Fantastic. Right, I'm going to drop some links quickly uh, to everything I've just done. And Mike, first of all, sure. thank you for joining us from London. And oh, no worries. <laughs> And are you happy if anyone has any questions for them to ask you right oh, now? Oh, yeah, yeah, go for it. So if anyone... Yeah, go for it. Um, and if you are, yeah. Well, I'm uh, just Mike, gonna... hey, oh. Julian here. Uh, I have a question hey. for you uh, around the compatibility with, like, with um, Turbo Links or, like, uh, Hotwire Turbo. Oh, yeah, yeah. Uh, because okay, yeah. you're serving the, like, the cache from the service worker, but Turbo also yeah. creates a cache that shows like while the request is coming and going. Uh, so how do yeah. those two like, uh, talk to each other? Okay, cool. Um, so I worked on the assumption that Turbo Links is great, but if you've already got the cache in the uh, service worker, it's probably better just to turn off the Turbo Links cache. Otherwise you're probably gonna have a bit of a bad time. I did have to write like a bit of extra code in one of my demos to be like, hey, if the request is a TurboLinks request, treat it a little bit differently because it's an Ajax request. Um, but generally you can like run them side by side and it will just work. Like it's not gonna be like a huge, like you're not gonna, like the only reason I say turn off the TurboLinks cache is if you've got a service worker is just cause you're not caching it twice. But 
it generally will just work fine once you're going to get it going. Is that, that good? Cool. Yeah, so yeah. that was a bit of a rambly answer. I think, Brendan, you had a question as well? Did I hear your voice? No? Okay, so did someone else have one? <laughs> Uh, there's something I maybe quite didn't understand, and is the the caching done automatically per URL you visit? Yeah. So um, with the Webpacker PDA WA, I used the Workbox library, and there was it just does the caching on the fly for you because that's a very common thing. Okay, um, so their library just handles that. Oh. Um, but if you want to like have it cache as you go through a site you've got to run it yourself if you don't use that library um, and it's pretty like doable there's lots of examples on how to write that uh, but it's easy just to use that workbox library um, i do actually have a question uh, awesome. Awesome, maybe before. Um, in terms of running stuff in the background um, <clears throat> does uh, does a service worker still run when the site is closed uh, not always. Um, so it will turn off and on willy nilly is um, kind of the best way to describe it. If you're viewing the site and you've got the tab open, it'll be there and running. And if you're navigating, it'll be there and running. If you put it on like a background tab, it might go to sleep. And if you close it, it might go to sleep. But um, yeah, uh, that's kind of the best way to describe it. <laughs> they're not as persistent, but they're very good for like, if you've got it bookmarked on your site, it will cache that data and store it for a good period of time. Um, sorry, I, I had a question as well. Um, I forgot. Caching's been around on websites for a while, right? So what's the yeah. difference between traditional caching and... Okay. Okay, so like you're talking about like head, like sending headers saying, okay, cache this file for a very, very long time from your server, which is totally good. That You should totally be doing that as well. But with this approach, this is allowing you to pre-cache stuff ahead of time and definitely save it and not even touch the network to check if that file has changed. So you can kind of like save like milliseconds and if your server goes down, so it can't return like a 304 not modified request, it will still just return that awesome little file. Oh, um, I, I also it's quite cool. both Jason and yourself mentioned that Heroku, especially the free um, Heroku, it, they, they stop. Um, like you have to spin up the website if no one's accessed it for a while. Um, I thought I'd just share that there's a website that I uh, linked to the chat called Caffeine um, with a K. Um, and what it does is you put in your Heroku app uh, address and it'll automatically ping your website every half an hour to keep no. you awake. So that might that, be something. That is that, it. Yeah. yeah, that's something isn't I there, do isn't there a most of my own. Like, you know, it has to be asleep for six hours in the day. I think they changed their rules that it's like you get 720 hours a month of like free credits. And then after that, you're paying. Um, but Heroku is awesome. Um, I think like once you get like an app where it gets a bit of traffic, it's like $7 to keep it alive. It's like, it's like nothing. Um, but there's also stuff like Versal, um, which does serverless Ruby now, which is amazing. That has been blowing my mind lately. Um, what was that? If anyone's tried. Um, there's an app called Versal. Um, where they let you do like little snippets of Ruby. So you can have like an endpoint just returning stuff. Um, that That is probably another talk I should do. Um, it's kind of like Lambda, but like just amazing. Uh, I should probably dump a link to that. I would love to ask what PWA. Yeah. Uh, I'm in. I'm in the wrong end of the stack to know what those. Oh. are. So please, if, if you don't oh, mind, that would be amazing. Yeah. Um, so PWA is like a progressive web app. It's the best way to kind of describe it is like you give like a little bit of extra a bit of extra information to the web browser when it loads your site to say, hey, if you add me as a bookmark, use these icons based on the screen size. And here's some extra places you can start. So if someone adds me to the home screen, they can go to a very specific page and it kind of feels like a mobile app. And it's kind of like a collection of technologies where when you start saving stuff on offline, your web app starts feeling super native. 
without that much work. And that's kind of like the coin term for it. Um, it's kind of hit and miss right now, though. Like iOS kind of doesn't really want it to ever take off, but they introduced some bits of it. But it's definitely quite fun. Like it's in most browsers and you can use it to get some nice performance wins. Thank you. Cool. No worries. Cool.